Welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment, Session 20718, Improving Reengagement in Care Using a Community Health Worker Model, Evidence from New Orleans. My name is Deborah Medina, and I am a public health analyst within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, the Division of Metropolitan HIV Programs, and I will be serving as your moderator for this session. Our speakers uh, today are Batsana Chantala, who is the director of the HIV program for the New Orleans EMA. She has been with the Ryan White program for 19 years. She, uh, Batsana started with the planning council and is now currently with the administrative agency. Our other speaker is Daniel Murdoch, who is the ending the HIV epidemic manager with the New Orleans Office of Health Policy and AIDS Funding. Daniel oversees program implementation for two New Orleans ending the HIV epidemic grants. He received a PhD in behavioral sciences from Emory University and has over 15 years of experience working in HIV research and program implementation. We thank you for joining today's session. As you participate, please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of the session, the presenters will have the opportunity to address your questions. Let's begin with the, with the recorded session. Hello, and welcome to our presentation today on improving re-engagement care using a community health worker model, evidence from New Orleans. I'm Daniel Murdoch. I'm the Ending the HIV Epidemic Manager with the Office of Health Policy and AIDS Funding, which is a division of the New Orleans Health Department. I'm joined today by Vasna Chantala, the director of our department. And this presentation was developed in collaboration with Fran Lawless, the previous director of the department. None of the presentation authors have any relevant financial interest to disclose. At the end of today's presentation, uh, participants should be able to identify opportunities and challenges to using community health workers to improve retention and re-engagement in care, discuss common barriers to care facing clients who have fallen out of care, and how community health workers can help address them, and discuss how community health workers can play a role in quality improvement work and help to prevent clients from falling out of care. Just so that we are all on the same page uh, in terms of what we mean when we say community health worker, um, I want to start off with a definition. Uh, so when we refer to a community health worker or a CHW, we are talking about a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of or has a close understanding of the community that they serve. And in terms of the Ryan White program, CHWs can specifically reduce the burden and stress of large caseloads um, and strengthen traditional Ryan White program care teams. And the, some of the ways that they strengthen those program care teams is by facilitating access to services and improving the quality and cultural competence of service delivery, as well as building individual and community capacity by increasing health knowledge and self-sufficiency through outreach activities, community education, and informal counseling, among other things. CHWs also can play a role in addressing COVID-related challenges to HIV care. And they can do this in a number of different ways, such as enhancing workforce capacity and working with clients uh, on an individual basis to help them overcome COVID-related barriers to care. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Basna Chantala, to discuss the development of our CHW intervention here in New Orleans. Hello. The New Orleans EMA um, have participated in a collaborative with the, the learning collaborative with the uh, UCSF. We started this process late 2019. Um, and by April 2020, we had our first design meeting. And if you may remember, uh, COVID. 19 started to hit the US in January of 2020 with the first case in Seattle. 
by March of 2020, we had exploded in New, New Orleans. Um, so our design meeting and the focus of the group was really on identifying opportunities and challenges to using telehealth services to improve engagement and retention and care for persons living with HIV who are out of care and or lost to follow up in New Orleans in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. The stakeholders included Part A funded agencies, both medical and social services agencies, um, state representation, we had other Ryan White parts and community members. The name of the group is uh, New Orleans Mission Undetectable. Next slide, please. So with that first learning session, we had a brainstorming session that included multiple stakeholders that really looked at what are some of the barriers to care as it relates to COVID-19 and how do we address some of those issues? So we took our brainstorming session and categorized them into different groups. Next slide. Um, from the different um, categories, we came up with our primary drivers and that included communication relationship, stigma, social determinants of health, access, and clinical factors um, slash service delivery. Next slide. So for example, in the primary drivers, um, in the example of communication relationship, we thought technology was a second driver, um, self-management and whole person care. And what that meant was, you know, some clients did not have access to a cell phone. So how can we provide telehealth? Um, self-management, how do they know when to access care and um, be able to, um, navigate the system of care on their own. And also we wanted a system that really checks in on clients, not just on the medication and primary care, but their whole health, um, mental health or um, just counseling services. Next slide. So in, in, in what you see here are the different drivers, um, the primary and the second drivers. Um, top left is the stigma where we looked at empowering clients to address stigma related issues, making sure that clinics have um, a friendly environment, um, addressing medical mistrust that some clients may have. In the example of social determinants of health is um, some of the drivers included clients with housing issue um, during this time and not being able to keep their housing, um, looking at employment because some clients um, are in the service industry and may may have been um, let go due to COVID-19. And also uh, issues such as food security. For access to care, uh, we identified transportation as one of the area um, in clients being able to access services. As you may remember during that time, um, a lot of public transportations were shut down. Um, some uh, dry share services were still in existence, but limited. Um, other second drivers included uh, health system literacy, which is educating clients on healthcare information. And that could mean understanding health insurance, um, how to navigate that and being able to utilize that to support their care. Um, other second drivers for access to care included having um, pharmacies issues and being able to access medications and so on. The last driver, clinical and factors, um, clinical factors and service delivery. Um, we looked at caseload because some uh, case managers indicated they have high caseloads. Um, being able to do a warm handoff to clients from one agency to another or from one service um, to another. Looking at um, home visits and being able to follow up on out of care patients. So in general, these were the different areas where we've reviewed and um, looked at and have identified where we can intervene. Next slide. And as you can see um, from what uh, we had saw it was a pretty diverse uh, list of activities. Um, and so we looked at, well, what are, what does our number look like? Um, for our care continuum, um, we, uh, in the New Orleans EMA in 2019, we had about 8,300 persons living with HIV. And for the 
viral suppression in the EMA um, is about at 67%. But we know that once we engage um, clients in care, their virus suppression is much higher. Next slide. In this slide, you see the uh, it, numbers of individuals who are not virally suppressed. Um, and you can see that for Part A clients and then also for the EMA on the left-hand side. For our gap in care measure for Part A clients, it's about 11% or 392 individuals. And for virus suppression um, by demographic, um, from what we reviewed, um, the EMA was at 67%. And But when you review that across subpopulation, you can see the different disparities. For example, among African-Americans, um, MSM, it is at 64%. However, but when compared to YMSM, it is at 75%. So we see this by different subpopulations um, and in order to really think about what are the populations that we will reach out to and who should we should reach out to. Next slide. So what we did was um, we leveraged our resources uh, through EHE funds to hire um, community health workers. Um, because we we had discussions and looked at different models around the country and thought that community health workers would be able to address different aspects of the drivers that were presented earlier. Um, each community health worker would be assigned to one of the Ryan White Part A agencies. Uh, we fund 10 different agencies, so some of the community health workers' um, time were split between two different agencies. Um, and at each agency, they would identify their own process to integrate a community health worker into their engagement in care efforts. In some areas, community health workers would receive the out of care list from their assigned agency and then they would work to re-engage clients in care. In addition to working on re-engaging in care, um, since these community health workers were also were funded by CDC EHE funds, they were also conducting HIV testing and prevention activities um, for some agencies that focus on community outreach. And that flow right into our process because we are immediately linking newly diagnosed individuals into care as well as preventing individuals from falling out of care and re-engaging individuals who were out of care back into care. Next slide. So for uh, just a reminder for the EHE pillars, um, the first pillar is uh, diagnose where you conducting um, or in jurisdiction, you conduct uh, HIV and other integrated screening activities. Um, and this in, would include um, activities that the community health workers would um, work on. Um, all the community health workers are certified in HIV counseling and testing. Um, for Pillar 2, they are involved in re-engaging persons who've fallen out of care. Pillar three, prevent their conducting outreach and providing condoms and education referrals to um, syringe um, services programs or syringe exchange programs and also PrEP services. Um, for pillar four um, is to assist agencies with responding and responding to outbreaks. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Murdoch to address re-engagement in care and provide you with more details on the impacts and results. Thanks, Vatsna. So um, Vatsna uh, outlined the uh, re-engagement process um, initially, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Um, so we allowed each Ryan White agency the flexibility to set their own criteria for uh, identifying an out-of-care list that they assigned to their community health worker. And agencies took a few different approaches. Uh, for example, some agencies decided to um, give CHWs lists that included the clients that were the hardest to reach, that they had many unsuccessful contacts uh, attempts with. Um, other agencies decided to really focus in on a specific priority population um, to populate the CHW out of care list. Uh, for example, um, one of our agencies really um, wanted CHWs to work on re-engaging African American women who had fallen out of care. And then another approach uh, was for uh, CHWs to be assigned um, a list with clients who, um, for whom case managers had already identified um, significant barriers to care. 
so in general, the process um, worked as follows. Uh, the community health workers would um, attempt to contact clients when those contacts were successful, um, identify barriers to care, and then work with clients to develop an individualized re-engagement and care plan, uh, help to schedule appointments uh, for primary care services, as, as well as make referrals to supportive services um, to address the barriers to care that were identified uh, by the clients themselves. Uh, so every agency's process is a little bit different, but typically this is um, how the, the process works. Uh, so the community health worker receives an out-of-care list, uh, makes initial attempts at contacting the client. Uh, if those attempts are successful, um, identifies the individual barriers to care with that client, uh, schedules appointments and makes referrals for supportive services to uh, address barriers to care, um, and then uh, sends texts and uh, makes phone calls with appointment reminders, um, as well as uh, calls and texts, uh, affirmation calls and texts, um, just to uh, check-ins, uh, see how that client is doing uh, on a given day, just to maintain uh, contact with a client throughout the process uh, and maintain a, a close, friendly relationship. Uh, in situations when that initial contact attempt is unsuccessful, uh, CHWs, uh, when available, uh, attempt alternative contact methods. And then if those methods are successful, go through that uh, same process I just identified. Um, if all contact methods are unsuccessful, uh, typically the community health worker will then inform um, a case manager who then refers the client to the uh, Louisiana State's uh, linkage system. So throughout this process, uh, community health workers have identified several common uh, barriers to care. Um, and here is a list of some of the, the most common and some of the approaches that community health workers have taken to address them. Uh, so first on this list is lack of transportation. Um, and to address this barrier to care, CHWs have uh, provided transportation vouchers, um, in some cases provided direct transportation assistance, um, and uh, when possible, um, arranged telehealth appointments um, for clients who had difficulty um, getting to a clinic site. Uh, other common barriers to care include um, issues with employment um, and or housing uh, instability. Um, and in these situations, community health workers uh, make referrals to available uh, workforce development and employment training services um, and or housing uh, support services as needed. Uh, another common barrier to care is uh, mental health and substance use concerns. Um, and in these situations, uh, CHWs make referrals to um, the appropriate services, including mental health, psychosocial support, uh, substance use counseling, uh, and or harm reduction. Uh, another common barrier is uh, scheduling conflicts. Um, and in these situations, um, the, having community health workers embedded um, within an agency is really helpful uh, because they're, they're able to work with agency staff um, to identify accommodating appointment times for uh, clients uh, for whom scheduling conflicts is a significant barrier to care. Uh, they're also able to, again, arrange telehealth appointments um, when appropriate and um, when needed, uh, refer to child care services. And then uh, a final common barrier to care uh, that CHWs have encountered is uh, stigma and fear of status disclosure. And um, it, addressing when addressing this barrier to care, the, uh, the close relationship that community health workers are able to have with clients um, is really, really essential. So here um, they can work one-on-one -on -one with clients to identify opportunities uh, when they may be able to attend an appointment without fear of um, having to disclose their HIV status to uh, family, friends, or peers uh, in order to attend that appointment. So here's a look at some of our initial numbers uh, on re-engagement and care. Uh, so these figures are uh, from between February 2021, uh, the first month of the intervention, and April 2022. Uh, in total, uh, during this time period, the community health workers attempted to contact 1,215 clients who had fallen out of care. 
Um, of those contacted, of those contact attempts, uh, CHWs were able to make uh, primary HIV care appointments for 455 clients. And so far of that group, 207 clients have attended an HIV primary care appointment and have now re-entered care. So some of the common challenges uh, that the CHWs have faced uh, with regard to re-engagement and care include, uh, first and foremost, locating clients. Uh, oftentimes, the, the client lists that CHWs are getting are, um, by definition, the hardest to reach clients. Um, and so uh, common challenges, uh, getting non-working numbers or out-of-date contact information, um, or discovering that a client may uh, be incarcerated or may have been previously incarcerated and their contact information has not been updated. Um, and in some situations, uh, CHW's ability to use social networks to reach uh, clients and collect a, a more up-to-date contact information has been a successful uh, strategy for locating hard to uh, reach clients. Another common barrier to care is uh, clinic hours. Um, here, uh, we have found that scheduling uh, telehealth um, can be a useful tool, um, but uh, still, uh, labs still require in-person visits. And then finally, um, a major uh, challenge um, for many clients is uh, many clients have dual diagnoses uh, that pose barriers to uh, receiving care. Um, some of these dual diagnoses include um, mental health diagnoses, uh, substance use disorders, and chronic conditions. And here, um, it's really important that when a CHW is able to uh, speak to a client, uh, develop an individualized re-engagement and care plan, that that re-engagement and care plan is really a holistic plan, because we know that Getting a client back into HIV primary care may be our priority, but it may not be the client's first priority. And so it's really important that those re-engagement and care plans emphasize holistic care, identify the priorities of uh, the client, um, and work to um, address those immediate concerns. So we uh, asked some of our um, agency staff members to uh, comment on um, how the CHW intervention has affected their agency. And here are a couple of the responses that we received. Uh, so a staff member at one agency said, from day one, she has fit in with our staff with ease and has been a great asset to our department. She has participated in community events, is able to effectively communicate with both our staff and our clients, and often provides fresh and new ideas to help us move forward and be productive. Another staff member at a different agency commented, they have been very helpful in creating one-on-one -on -one relationships with our patients to encourage and actually get them to attend their appointments. So now I'm gonna move to discussing the uh, activities that the CHWs engage in to support uh, retention and care. Um, one of the, uh, the biggest ways that CHWs support retention and care is through uh, administration of patient experience questionnaires. Um, so these are uh, questionnaires that are um, given to clients uh, after attending an appointment. And specifically, they're relatively short, uh, but specifically they ask, uh, was information explained clearly? Uh, was the clinic or agency welcoming? Um, were you treated with respect? Um, were your privacy and confidentiality observed? Um, were you involved in healthcare decision making? And did the provider spend enough time with you? And here we found that by having community health workers administer these uh, questionnaires, um, it really allows them to identify client concerns in real time. Uh, and when necessary, bring them to the attention of agency staff and work to resolve problems. And being able to address those concerns um, uh, right after they are raised um, really can help improve quality, care quality and prevent clients from falling out of care. Uh, 
Um, and we know by um, talking uh, with clients that they often report that they feel more comfortable discussing their uh, patient experiences with a community health worker than they um, otherwise would uh, with another with a provider or another uh, agency staff member. Um, and here are a few examples of some of the, the kinds of concerns that get raised in uh, these questionnaires. Uh, so one example is when a client said that they felt unheard, uh, when they raised concerns about uh, their blood pressure medications. Another client said that a staff member made them state personal information in front of other people, which made them feel uncomfortable. And then another example is when a client said they felt left in the dark regarding their treatment and care options. Uh, another way that CHWs have uh, supported retention and care efforts is uh, by recently, uh, just this spring, administering uh, an emergency preparedness survey uh, to Part A clients. And specifically, this survey asked clients about their experiences accessing HIV primary care and uh, HIV medications um, during and immediately after Hurricane Ida. Um, and with the help of the community health workers, we were able to collect responses from 194 clients. And the information that we gathered from the survey was really vital to informing our EMA-wide efforts to uh, help clients remain engaged in care um, during future emergencies. So I'll share just a few of the um, results that we um, uh, got from this survey. Uh, so. We, we thought it was important to look at the results to separate out clients who evacuated the New Orleans area and clients who stayed in the New Orleans area to see if there were any meaningful differences. So you'll see that in the next few slides. Uh, so the first uh, question that we asked was um, whether clients had uh, problems accessing um, HIV primary care uh, during and immediately after the storm. And so looking um, on the left at clients who evacuated, um, among that group of those who tried to access care, we found that 30% were unable to do so. And then on the right, among those who stayed in the New Orleans area, uh, we found similarly of those who tried to access care, 32% were unable to do so. Um, and then similarly, we asked about access to medications um, and looking at uh, clients who evacuated, of those who tried to access medications um, during and immediately after the storm, 21% had problems accessing their medications. And then among clients who stayed in the New Orleans area, of those who tried to access medications, a quarter uh, experienced problems accessing medications. We also asked uh, clients um, who indicated that they had problems accessing medications, we asked them what those problems were. So here we're looking at the responses among clients who evacuated. And there is a pretty uh, even distribution of uh, responses indicating um, not a client did not have their prescription on them. Uh, they did not know where to go to get a prescription. Uh, or they had a prescription, but did not know where to go to get uh, the prescription filled to get medications. Um, and being denied assistance at a pharmacy, uh, for example, the pharmacy not accepting insurance, um, pharmacy not having medications uh, or not having the prescription. And then just under a third of clients who evacuated um, also listed um, other reasons for not, uh, having problems accessing their medications. And um, some of those, um, those reasons included uh, delays in um, having an order, but it taking um, nine days in one situation, um, not being able to get a referral, um, being uh, living in a residential facility um, who uh, the staff uh, were typically responsible for their medications, um, and then not being in that residential facility any longer. And then also issues uh, regarding stigma and um, in one situation, a client indicated that their family didn't know their status, which posed a challenge to uh, getting their prescription filled. Uh, we asked the same question of uh, clients who stayed in New Orleans. And here we see um, pretty different uh, responses. 
so the most, the two most common responses here uh, were uh, being denied assistance at a pharmacy, and then over half of clients who stayed uh, identified other problems accessing their medications. Uh, most often, this was uh, the pharmacy was closed or they didn't have their medications in stock. Um, a few clients indicated that um, they had issues uh, with getting medications for um, dual diagnoses. Um, and uh, many clients indicated that uh, when a pharmacy was open, uh, the wait times were very long um, or they were not open uh, during uh, typical hours. Uh, we also asked clients, how much medication did you have on hand when the storm hit? And the overwhelming majority of clients indicated that they had uh, 30 days or less worth of medications on hand. So um, how did this information um, affect um, our retention and care efforts and our emergency plan? Well, first, um, looking at the medication on hand data, um, we identified a, a need for expanding access to 90-day prescriptions, uh, particularly in advance of um, hurricane season. Uh, agencies also uh, work to update their emergency protocols, uh, for example, protocols of what to do in the event of a power outage, as well as protocols of how to share information with clients, how to inform clients um, ahead of storm season or uh, how to access medications and health information following a natural disaster. Uh, we also um, identified a need to coordinate better with uh, surrounding states um, and other uh, agencies within Louisiana. Then one of the questions that we asked in this survey was, uh, if you evacuated, where did you go? And so this really helped us to pinpoint um, what are the states that we should really be um, working with um, to, uh, to better coordinate um, with regard to emergency planning. Uh, also, um, at the EMA level, uh, it has inspired us to develop plans for improved uh, interagency communication uh, in the event of a natural disaster, um, as well as uh, begin planning um, uh, the development of an emergency public information hub uh, where clients can access information, um, for example, about pharmacy closures. Uh, so a few uh, lessons that we have learned uh, with regard to retention and care and the CHW intervention. Uh, first and foremost, CHWs, uh, their um, position in the community um, and as a trusted uh, resource really um, allows them to be uniquely effective at gathering quality improvement data. Um, and this is because clients often express greater comfort sharing information with a CHW. Uh, also, um, with regard to the uh, patient experience questionnaires, the community health workers' ability to identify and address um, clients' concerns quickly uh, can actually be a really effective strategy um, for preventing clients uh, who may be at risk of falling out of care, who maybe had a bad experience and said, well, I'm not going back there. Um, to be able to address those issues in real time um, can be uh, really effective. Um, and next, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, our at-home HIV testing um, initiative and how um, CHWs play um, a, a vital role in, in uh, that initiative. Uh, so as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, COVID had a significant impact on HIV testing, particularly in 2020, also into 2021. Um, and even still today. Um, so in the, um, the chart on the right, you can see the uh, number of HIV tests uh, in the New Orleans EMA uh, that were conducted at publicly funded sites in 2019, and then the significant drop off of tests conducted in 2020. Um, and this, uh, this happened for a couple of different reasons. Um, first, uh, especially in the early days of the pandemic, a lot of testing sites just had to pause operations. Um, so tests just weren't available. And then even um, when tests became um, more available, 
um, clients were still hesitant to access in-person testing um, because of um, uh, COVID-related um, health concerns. So in response to this situation, uh, we launched a text-to-test initiative in June of 2021. Um, and the way the, the initiative works is that um, residents can request an at-home HIV test kit uh, by texting the word test to um, an automated uh, text messaging number. And um, that automated uh, service will ask for the client's contact information and ask for their consent uh, for a community health worker to contact them. Uh, once a request is received, uh, it is assigned to a community health worker. Um, and then uh, that CHW will contact the client to set up a time to uh, drop off their home test kit, as well as a time to uh, conduct a virtual testing appointment, uh, which can happen over the phone or over FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, um, whatever the, the client prefers. Um, but uh, basically the way that that at-home testing appointment works is CHWs will serve as testing navigators and the process is as similar as can be to if the testing were to be conducted in person. So they walk clients through the entire testing process. Uh, they engage the client in a discussion about risk reduction. Uh, they help the client to interpret the test result. And then they make referrals um, as necessary, uh, such as referrals for confirmatory testing or uh, referrals for prevention services. A few lessons that we have learned uh, so far uh, through the Texas Test Initiative um, is that uh, first, uh, marketing is key. Uh, we, we had a pretty low demand in the first several months of the initiative. Um, and so we, we learned our lesson there, uh, really rolling out targeted marketing. Uh, also, it is important uh, when a community health worker has that first um, phone uh, contact with the client to schedule a test drop-off time that they are actually, you know, filling in some of the um, information that they would be, um, that they'll be collecting during the testing appointment. So collecting that demographic info uh, can be really helpful because if we um, do experience a situation of loss of follow-up, uh, we can look at trends to see are is there one group or, you know, several groups who were losing more than others? And we can work to um, correct that. Uh, it's also important to schedule the testing appointment um, as close to the test drop off time as possible, ideally within 24 hours um, in order to uh, minimize loss to follow up. Uh, and it's also too important to um, uh, make clients aware that there is a 20 minute wait time for their test results uh, so that they know um, exactly how long it will take uh, for the testing appointment. Uh, and it's also important to uh, establish procedures for CHWs to verify the test result. So if it is a uh, on camera testing appointment, you know, showing the, um, the result on camera, or if it is uh, uh, a testing appointment that is conducted over the phone, asking the client to um, take a picture of the test results and send it to the community health worker. Um, and this is important for a number of reasons. First, um, it allows the community health worker to um, help clients accurately interpret uh, the test results. Um, also, from a data standpoint, um, it really um, is essential for us to uh, make sure that we are um, accurately identifying um, test results. Uh, it's also important to have uh, linkage to care systems in place and to make sure that community health workers are aware of those linkage to care systems and how to access them. Um, and something that we are uh, beginning to explore is how uh, incentives uh, may be used to reduce loss to follow up. Okay, and next I uh, will discuss the community health workers role in um, outreach and prevention activities. So um, our community health worker team regularly conducts, uh, conducts venue-based and event-based outreach um, every week. 
Um, and uh, during these events, they distribute prevention information as well as safer sex resources. They conduct uh, on-site HIV testing um, and um, make referrals for services. Um, these events are also a great way to address um, HIV stigma and promote U equals U. Um, an example of one of the ways that our CHW team does this is um, during their outreach events, they have um, pledge cards uh, that stop HIV stigma pledge cards uh, that they uh, ask community members to uh, fill out and, and specifically fill out um, one way in which they are going to work to stop HIV stigma. And these outreach events are really important because they increase the visibility and social standing of the community health workers within the community. And they help to destigmatize interactions with community health workers. Because community health workers are providing status neutral services, there's not an assumption that if you're talking to a community health worker that you are a person living with HIV. So a few uh, lessons learned overall um, throughout the CHW intervention. Uh, first is that um, adaptability is really important. Um, giving Part A agencies the flexibility to um, integrate CHWs into their workflow and um, specify how a CHW can address their agency specific needs um, was really important. Uh, also, the community outreach component of uh, CHW work is, is really essential because um, that really helps to um, reinforce the insider status of community health workers within the community um, and build trust and uh, uh, expand their visibility in the community. Uh, also, we've found that uh, community health workers can play a really important role in quality improvement work. Um, specifically, specifically, that insider status is what helps them to um, work with clients uh, closely uh, in a way in which clients feel comfortable raising concerns um, that CHWs can then identify, can then uh, work to address. Um, it's also really important um, at the agency level uh, to establish uh, strong communication and reporting systems, uh, specifically um, between community health workers and case managers. Um, so this can help to prevent uh, duplication of efforts between CHWs and case managers. And it can also help to prevent loss to follow up uh, where a client um, gets, uh, you know, falls through the cracks because they're not on either list. Um, another uh, lesson uh, learned um, that we've experienced is a relatively high CHW turnover, uh, but we actually see this as a good thing uh, because uh, the uh, CHWs that we have, uh, that we initially hired, um, that we that are no longer part of the CHW team, uh, actually went on to work uh, either at the ag their agencies permanently or uh, in other uh, HIV programs, uh, such as at the uh, Louisiana uh, State Health Department. So we see this as an example of how uh, the CHW intervention is actually training, um, giving uh, workers a new skills that, that will enable them to uh, strengthen the HIV uh, care workforce um, in other ways and in you know, longer term. And then finally, I'll end uh, with a few uh, lessons that we've learned um, about how community health workers can help address COVID related challenges. Um, so our CHW team has done this in a few different ways. Um, uh, at one point, they were distributing COVID home test kits uh, to clients uh, in order to uh, help uh, promote uh, re-engagement and care. Uh, the CHWs continue to distribute HIV home test kits um, to address uh, testing site uh, closures or uh, COVID-related uh, testing hesitancy. Um, and CHWs have been helpful in scheduling uh, telehealth appointments and arranging for transportation assistance, uh, as well as uh, making referrals for a range of supportive services, uh, but specifically um, for mental health services, as we know that the COVID pandemic um, has had a significant impact um, on um, everyone's mental health. 
So here is uh, a reference that I included earlier in the slides. And here is the uh, contact information uh, for Batsna and myself. And um, this uh, presentation is uh, eligible for CE credit. And uh, if uh, you wish to claim it, here is the uh, link to do so. And thank you for uh, your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Uh, before we begin our, our Q&A session, we would like to thank our presenters for addressing this uh, very interesting uh, topic. At this time, we will post questions from attendees that we have been collecting throughout the presentation from the chat. Please note that you may still submit questions using the chat feature. Okay, now let's move to the first question. Actually, the first question has already been addressed. Do you use a template for re-engagement plans? If so, are you willing to share this? And uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, contact Daniel Murdoch, who are our, our uh, presenter for today, and at daniel.murdoch at nola.gov, for example. And he put his uh, contact information, it's in the chat. Our second question, how did you address uh, the patient concerns mentioned in the questionnaire? When we share comments like that with clinic staff, they get very defensive and deny that it happened. Yeah, uh, that has been a, a concern in some situations for us as well. Um, it has been um, a bit of a mixed bag. We, we have had issues where um, a community health worker has brought a concern to staff, have, has been able to resolve it, um, but that's not always the case. Um, we know that um, sometimes um, clinic staff members can be um, a little bit defensive, um, and you know we we just try the best that we can. Okay, our next question was: Is script available? I think that varies by agency. And part of what we found in that process is that um, clients may not have access to the internet or don't know where to get their scripts. Or if they did, I mean, I think the data show that even if they um, had scripts, they didn't know where to go to get those scripts filled. So we had a variety of issues um, in dealing with medication access following Hurricane Ida. And um, I'll just do a shout out right now. Tomorrow, on Friday, I'll actually be presenting with um, Dr. Ritchie on emergency preparedness and also um, addressing some of those issues. Okay, thank you. Our next question, how are the experts, uh, meaning those living with HIV, utilizing the development, implementation, and evaluation of this pilot? So the collaboration is with UCSF and um, University of California at San Francisco, and the collaboration is funded by HRSA. So the um, collaborative itself was developed by HRSA, but the actual implementation process where we went through the learning sessions and um, where we pull all the different partners to get together to uh, identify areas of uh, needs and barriers um, that included community input in the process. And that's been really helpful because when we had gotten to the um, session where we, we have a learning collaborative learning session where it's an all day session um, that included community um, members where they gave us information on, well, you know, let's think about developing certain items that we can include in a state kit or a goal kit. And so um, just having different perspectives um, has really been um, uh, helpful in this whole process. And I'll just add um, that we have um, tried to encourage um, applicants for CHW positions um, who do have lived experience. Um, and so we have had um, community health workers um, who uh, were persons living with HIV um, support impl uh, intervention implementation. Okay, thank you. How are Ryan White HIV AIDS program funds leveraged to ensure not in care are able to re-engage? 
the leverage part is where the community health workers mm -hmm. are um, placed at different Ryan White agencies. And so they are um, embedded in the agency, so they learn the agency's process. If the clients need to be referred to certain services, then they would work with the case managers to um, obtain those different services. And often those services are funded by Ryan White Part A, especially when you're talking about, um, for in our area, uh, transportation, housing, food. We have uh, two questions now related to to um, medications. How are you working with patients who have insurance that does not allow the, a 90 day script? I agree that 90 day scripts are a huge asset in retention in care, but many of our patients have insurance that does not allow that, particularly for specialty medications. And then it, uh, another person asks, are there 30 and 90 day prescription access based upon state ADAPs? So um, <clears throat> the background story is that with uh, Louisiana, we've expanded Medicaid. So the state um, has expanded Medicaid. And when COVID hit, there was an emergency order that was passed that allowed for 90 day prescriptions. What we found in this situation is that a lot of some providers actually didn't know that was allowable. Um, so in our QI process, um, that's one thing that you may want to look at is are, are the providers aware that it's available, first of all, versus that it's just not available. And then for um, our clients, you know, for the most part, I haven't heard of ins our insurance company where they didn't allow the 90 day prescriptions. But one of the things that agencies work with clients on is um, making sure they are on time in getting their meds. Um, can't go into too much detail, but there are some even situations where uh, case managers encourage clients to, you know, once after a certain period of time, they can order their meds and so that they have it on hand so that by a certain period of time, they have a little bit um, more meds um, than what they actually have on hand. And so that gives them some cushion room. But um, to answer the question about ADAP, um, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, Part A expanded uh, to allow our Ryan Wright agencies to um, write prescriptions for 90 days and ADAP did the same thing. So for our clients, um, as far as medication, whether it's funded by Medicaid, uh, whether it's Ryan Wright Part A or Part B, they had access to those meds. Um, a lot of our clients are on um, the marketplace insurance options. And so um, they... I haven't heard of them having issues with that, but I can follow up on that. But I think the biggest thing is one, to make sure that clients are aware when they can fill their meds. Um, if 90 day prescriptions are allowable, that providers are aware of it. And if not, to advocate for it. Um, and that's one of the things that we're doing is, you know, when the emergency order ends, we um, would like for Medicaid to continue to expand and, and allow 90 day prescriptions. And I believe that's something that is um, being reviewed. Okay. Uh, of the 200 plus clients re-engaged in care, how many virally suppressed are virally suppressed and what was needed to assist them? Um, I don't have those figures um, right now, but that is the next area that we are looking to do some data analysis um, to see um, uh, what does the longer term re-engagement in care look like? Uh, how effective is the community health intervention for uh, not just getting folks re-engaged in care, but keeping them in care? Um, so that, that's going to be our next objective. Next question. So this was HIV antibody test rather than a venous draw for, for a fourth generation HIV test? So, um, I, yeah, if you're referring to the at-home testing, uh, we use the uh, Orishore um, uh, nasal swab. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Orishore at-home test. Okay. How, how many at home test kits have been performed? How many seropositive results have there been so far? 
So um, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, uptick uh, or request for at-home tests was initially pretty slow. Um, and that was because we didn't have an accompanying um, marketing strategy. Um, so we have distributed um, less than 100 test kits so far. Um, and the seropositivity rate has been about 2%. So we are we are now embarking on a new effort um, to uh, promote the at home testing um, through a coordinated marketing initiative um, and really do um, targeted marketing um, in high prevalence communities. Okay. How did you encourage patients to come in for confirmatory testing since the in since this initiative was in place due to hesitancy to enter clinic as a result of COVID? Yeah, so that's uh, another lesson that we have learned um, and have since sought to correct. Um, so uh, in the cases where individuals tested positive, um, we would uh, schedule an appointment, uh, preferably a same-day appointment, to come in for confirmatory testing. Um, and now uh, our updated approach is uh, to have community health workers equipped um, with uh, another um, uh, type of HIV test to be able to offer um, at-home confirmatory testing as well. Okay. What kind of collaborations with state partners is there to support training development of uh, community health workers in the community? So the community health worker intervention is a collaboration uh, between the Louisiana Department of Health um, and um, the New Orleans Health Department. Um, and so the uh, training um, supervision um, uh, of our uh, community health worker team has been um, completely uh, done in collaboration with the state. Um, and I know that the uh, state also has, uh, there are also other uh, local jurisdictions throughout the state that have community health worker uh, programs uh, that the state uh, provides uh, training and uh, oversight. And if I could add to that, so one of the ways that we leverage resources, because um, all of this started as a QI process, um, was to be able to get the trainings um, completed or paid for by um, the collaboration with UCSF. And there's a local entity, it's called the LaShawn Training for Community Health Workers. And there's a set curriculum of about 10 major topics that the community health workers participate in. And then in addition to that, we have training provided by the state on topics such as U equals U. Um, and then we have links to um, free trainings that are online that we share with the community health workers also. Okay. Do your CHW deal with African immigrants and if they speak different language, how do they get them in if they are out of care? I have not um, heard this concern specifically come up, um, but as we are um, hiring staff, we are always thinking about um, language access and um, trying to hire uh, staff who are multilingual and if not, um, being able to reach out to other resources to assist with um, language uh, translation. Okay, thank you very much. We went through all the questions in the chat. <coughs> uh, Thank you again for your participation today as part of the HIV AIDS Bureau's effort to provide uh, you with uh, interesting speakers and topics. We appreciate you filling out the session evaluation at the end of each, uh, of each session. If you are seeking continuing education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access these evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue, blue evaluation links. Thank you very, very much and have a great rest of your day, either be afternoon or evening. Thank you very much.